Can packaging do more than protect a product? Can it shape the brand's identity and forge a deeper connection with its audience? At Base Design, the answer is a resounding yes. This isn't just a packaging agency. They create entire worlds through design, literally. We are working with companies to really build worlds. And for example, I think in today's worlds, be it in food, in beauty, there is a tendency to get very tactical. And the strongest brands in these various sectors are the ones that actually think of themselves in the sense of worlds or world building and how that gets executed across myriad channels and myriad touch points that may include packaging. I'm Avelio Matos, and this is Packaging Unboxed. In an industry filled with tutorials and videos on making packaging look good, we are going beyond aesthetics. We're breaking down how elite designers at the top of their game craft brand defining moments. These aren't just packs, they're strategic moves that reshape global brands. As creative director of idpdirect.com, I've seen firsthand how high-end packaging for fashion, tech, and luxury markets can make or break a brand story. The private conversations that we have with our clients about the details, the textures, everything should be shared with you because mastering packaging means mastering the brand. This is why I created Packaging Unboxed to give you an inside look at the creative process and give you career insights from the world's top designers Insights that can help you win your next big client, grow your agency, or push your own skill levels to the next stage. Or if you're a student, maybe it'll make that B and do an A minus. Today, we're talking to Jeff Cook and Anthony Franklin from Base Design. You're going to learn how their approach to packaging goes far beyond just creating objects. It's about building cohesive brand experiences wherever there is a touch point. From color, typography, it all serves a greater story. But first, let's find out a little bit about base design. We are an international, vertically integrated branding agency with locations in New York, Geneva, Brussels, and Melbourne. We are a branding agency first. You may not know we're the ones behind the work, having just rebranded the App Store for Apple or working with H&M on bringing back some of the dynamism that they had in the 90s working with Pharrell on creating the Good Time Hotel brand. So we tend to touch a lot of different sectors from fashion, food, luxury, beauty, which are all very packaging heavy, but also going into cultural institutions and even things like airports and sports teams. How does a single agency create the new digital app store for Apple? How do they relaunch a 130 year old company how do they deliver completely new experiences at New York's JFK Terminal 4? Let's find out what makes base design different. So I think a lot of firms are, for example, either strategy or strategy and identity focused. And we have always chosen to think about or think with businesses about their, their overarching strategy for their brands and institutions at the highest levels. And then think about how that then reconciles into a virtual uh, visual identity and then gets applied. And that's, I think, not always the case, but we prefer to then work with uh, companies on how that work then gets applied to things like packaging, campaigns, digital. And even on the digital side, it's extremely rare for a smaller mid-sized firm to be vertically integrated within digital, for example, to have development in-house. So when we say vertically integrated, we really go from A to Z, or as we jokingly say, A to UX. And uh, really, for most of our clients, we really are a one-stop shop. There, there's really nothing that they will need that we can't do. In order to run an agency that's this size, you've got to get away from the work. You've got to focus on sales and strategy. What about those people that want to remain graphic designers and hone their craft for their entire lives? The ones that don't want to climb the corporate ladder, that don't want to get further and further away from creating physical design and actually getting their hands dirty. I think there's nothing wrong being a graphic designer all your life. And I think, I mean, I work with designers every day, so we need uh, senior, extra senior designers. And I think you can, I think you can grow as a designer. 
and I think this is more of a personal choice when if, if you want to to grow into a role that's different, then of course, then you have to move away from from the actual making of things. But but I mean, I think it's this, this is a very personal choice. Before we talk about the work, we need to take a step back and understand what defines a strong brand. And this is critical because everything, packaging, digital experiences, everything should bolden and strengthen the brand. I think the strongest brands today are the ones that have very engaged communities around their products and services. I think it's the storytelling and the bond you create with the audience. So I think if you have a strong storytelling and you're true, then you create a very strong bond and then you're a powerful brand. And it can be small or big, of course. There's the obvious answer that Apple remains the world's strongest brand, but you can have a very strong brand that's small, niche, local, but has a passionate community, a passionate, loyal community around what it is that they're doing. All right, so let's get to the work. Seeing the latest packaging for Bon Genie is the reason that I reached out to Base Design in the first place. I was so excited to get the backstory, but then I couldn't believe everything else that they did. Now, packaging was just a tiny little piece of it. Before we get to the pack, let's understand who Bon Genie is and what was the initial ask that Base Design was challenged with. Bon Genie Greeder is a, um, it's a department store. It's like Harrods or Selfridges or Blooming Days, I think you have in, in New York. It's family owned and family run. It's been there since 1891, so it's more than 130 years old. So it, it doesn't sell elegance, it really owns it, embodies it by its history. And they've got a unique approach on service and the way they take care of, their, of the clients, of, of, of the clientele. Um, and they, they offer like a very boutique-like experience. And I think that the challenge for them and the reason they approached us is that the behavior of consumers is changing it, and, and you know that it's, it's going toward digital. What they expect of a store is, is, is different. They expect a, a special experience, a special treatment. And I think Bon Genie were at, this, at, this, at a point where they needed to, to update their kind of an outdated image, something that they, they'd been hanging on to for a while. And they needed something that positioned them at the same level as the brands they were selling. Because I think that's the expectations of the people going into that store. And also, I think they wanted to, I don't think I know, they want to appeal to a newer generation, a generation that's connected today. And, and, and that was the ask. Rebranding a company with over a century of history isn't about a new typeface and a fresh coat of paint. It's about making bold decisions that honor the past while embracing the future. Bon Genie was more than a department store. It was an institution, but to attract a younger generation, they needed more than just a facelift. They needed a transformation that would resonate with modern consumers without losing the elegance they were known for. And that's where base design stepped in, starting with two bold moves that would redefine everything. I think we did two big bold moves. One was reverting back to the original name, Bon Genie, because with the years they, they they'd become Bon Genie Greeder, which is kind of a it came through acquisitions and stuff like that. It's kind of a trend of uh, um, an older trend that companies had of putting names together. So what we did was we reverted back to the to, to the old name, Bon Genie, kind to assess the fact that it was family owned, going back to the original name. And then I think the next bold move was the color. They did own a color, a blue that's it's quite close to the one we we set out to use, but we we tweaked it in a way to infuse kind of a more powerful statement to it. So I think these two bold moves were, were the biggest things that we implemented. I think the idea was that this new identity with the refreshed logo, with the monogram, with the typeface was a way of reinterpreting that elegance that they had kind of lost within the years. And it, it was adapted for the modern area, era. So I think and, and the main, uh, one of the main ideas or the main idea was endless elegance. That was the main dr drive and the main concept behind all, all the branding identity. When it comes to branding, color is so much more than just a design choice. It's the foundation of how a brand communicates its identity across every single touch point 
from the packaging to the website to the physical storefront. And that one shade becomes a signature, instantly recognizable element by consumers. But how do you choose a color that tells a story of a brand's heritage, their vision, and their future? We think of the brands in a holistic way. When we decided to do those moves with the color, it naturally had to be present in the art direction. Of course, it had to be present on the packaging, but it had to be present on the typeface, depending on, on the way it's used. It, it, so that, that consistency, I think that also something that maybe makes us a bit different, the consistency in a way we want the brand to, to show itself is maybe different is maybe a different approach than a, a pure cap packaging company that would maybe th think of an object and an object. And yeah, I don't know, Jeff, if you have an, a point of view on that. And this idea of owning a color is one that's proven effective time and again. If we think of orange with Hermes, you know, Robin shell with Tiffany and so on and so forth. So given that there was a historical precedent with the blue, it's something we knew that we could lean into and be true to the brand and at the same time render it immediately iconic. So you've built these digital assets, these rules, these parameters, but that's all in the ether. It isn't until you build the packaging that you actually make something, something physical that can connect with a consumer. So how can packaging support that big brand story and still connect with a consumer? Let's find out how packaging plays a role in this. So the packaging is, is part of an ecosystem of touch points, okay? So we build a brand, we, we've got that brand existing in, in the shops, in the catalogs, in, on the website, and then there's kind of the first physical touch point maybe is, 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 the, is the packaging. And we want that packaging to tell the same story that we've built for the brand. So it has to, it has to, bend, it has to blend uh, this understated luxury with kind of a distinctive presence. So we, we use that signature blue that we've, we've defined. And also we want it to last during the years. We don't know how, it's not something that's going to be changed every, uh, every year. So it's, it has to be something that's, that becomes kind of a, in French, we say porte parole, um, the megaphone of the brand. And also it has to reach the same standards as the products or the brands that have been bought in these in this department store. So the clients expect the same quality um, than any kind of store they would walk in, walk in and, and, and buy a specific brand into. So, so that's, that's kind of the aim. We have, to, we have to be in that, we have to be telling that story and we have to, be, to have that quality. I guess the bold move is to, to do the same as we did for the brand. It's to use the, the, the blue to use the signature of the, uh, of the logo type, and, and that's it. It's, it's kind of the simple, complex thing. I always say the moment a customer touches the box, they're forming an impression of the brand. It's not just about what's inside, but it's about how the entire experience feels from the weight of the box to the way it opens. Anthony Franklin, creative director at Base Sun, explains why getting every detail of the unboxing experience right is essential for luxury brands, especially for luxury brands. These boxes have to, to last in a way that people use, usually keep them in their, in their dressing rooms or, or either as a present or themselves. So the quality has to be the highest possible. So it's not like, it's not gonna break when you, when you take it. Um, and I think there's, in the unboxing experience, we, we added a few details like um, there were uh, ribbons, uh, stickers, uh, the soft paper, uh, but all of those were discussed with the clients. I mean, they were, they were, they, this is things that they wanted and we, we just kind of bounced back and, and, and answered in our branding kind of overview, it should be like this. Being vertically integrated and having years of experience, base design is well equipped to take on any challenge regardless of scale. Talking about scale, beauty packaging tends to have the least amount of real estate to tell a story and communicate brand. I think that packaging plays an outsized role in the world of beauty in the sense that it is a highly, highly saturated market and packaging accounts for a great deal for why a consumer would purchase a product. 
So really, if we think about the rise of D2C brands, or if you f- think about selling in an environment like Sephora that's uh, full of product, it may be really the, the first and most important point of contact that a consumer has with the product. And what I find really interesting about beauty in particular is the, this, this idea I was thinking about of, of layers, whether you're online or imagine you walk into a Sephora. So you see the product for the first time at a distance. And that, at the first moment, has to be iconic. There has to be something about it that grabs you viscerally. And then layer number two, as you sort of get closer to the product, there has to be something that identifies what market it's for. Is it for young people? Is it for older people? Is it luxury? Is it mass? So there are certain codes that trigger this idea that, oh, this is probably for me. So I'm A, attracted to it. B, it's for me. Layer three, as you get closer, you're probably then conscious in beauty of its functionality. Is it a skincare brand? Is it a makeup brand? There are cues that start to talk about, is it about efficacy and so on and so forth. As you get yet again, another step closer, you're getting closer to the packaging and you maybe start to read things on the packaging about ingredients, for example. And I don't know what layer we're at, but maybe the fifth layer or sixth layer is when you then unbox And you get to the primary packaging and it's about the feel of it in your hand or the look of it or the that experience you have unboxing it so what i think is really unique about beauty potentially food as well is that you have these different layers of engaging with a brand within packaging and i think it therefore is vitally important that uh, as you're designing packaging that you're thinking about all of these layers and the experience or the journey that a consumer has from the moment she walks into a store, counters that product online to the moment that she's holding it in her hand. There's so many brands attempting to fabricate luxury by adding layers upon layers of design. But if you can't define luxury, you can't design luxury. Designers often look to category cues, which then lock you in. Here's Jeff's take on designing to these cues. There's a temptation to answer that if you use such and such quality or you employ such and such a typeface. And it's not that that's untrue. I believe that luxury is about time. And that luxury brands understand the value of your time and therefore engage with you in ways that honor and respect your time. The temptation, again, for a lot of brands is sort of a cut and paste approach. So they have a certain look that they cut and paste across a range of packaging. The brands that are doing it best, the luxury brands and others that are doing it best, are those that surprise you, that engage you, and that make you feel a certain way. And that is often done by being creative with your packaging. And that could be expressed across varying the design across a range of packaging. So it looks more like a family than, you know, septuplets. Or think carefully about the copy and what it's meant to say and how it engages you. And that respect for one's time, I find to be very luxurious. The team at Base Design have delivered everything that speaks to prestige and elegance with a simple folding box for the brand from Roy. So how does Base Design define luxury? And once you've defined luxury, how does it translate into design? So Chef Roy is one of the world's great pastry chefs. And for those that don't know his product, he makes an exquisite Italian cake called a panettone that is the hardest thing to make in the world of baked goods. True story. When he came to us, he said, I'm going to make panettone, which you tend to think of as something that resembles a sponge that you get at Trader Joe's for $8. 
and mine is going to be exquisite, the best thing you've ever tasted, much more exponentially more expensive, but worth it. And the idea behind the brand is that for me, it's really personal because he worked at all the most famed restaurants. And when he set out to start his own company, he really said, this is really my gift to each and every customer. I was really from me to them. And when we heard that, we actually said, okay, well then let's treat the brands and therefore the packaging as such, as this luxurious gift from Roy to his customers. Now, once I tell you that the packaging is really more inspired by the world of luxury goods than food. So we decided consciously to play with the codes of food and to not have it, the brand reside in the world of food, but have it reside more in the world of luxury products. When you go back and look at the brand of From Roy and you look at the package, you say, huh, I don't know exactly why, but this feels like luxury. And it's explicitly because we made the conscious decision on the front end that it would play with the codes of luxury, that we would develop for the side of a box, a manifesto that speaks to the craft of making a panettone and the rigor and how difficult that is to develop something so exquisite that it melts in your mouth. And you say to yourself, I will spend any amount of money because I have to taste that again. That all speaks to luxury. And that contrast and the look of that box, which is almost evocative of Chanel, and then you open it and to find a pastry, that juxtaposition is really, I think, what's resonating so strongly with Oprah Winfrey, who has twice named it on her list of products. As a fan of design, I literally got goosebumps when I saw the URL for From Roy. It is thisisfromroy.com, which comes back full circle to the fact that this is a gift from Roy to his customers, confirming the depths and the details at which you have to go to to build these worlds. Brand has to be executed at every turn, all the way down to a URL or the, the smallest, most minute details are the ones that matter. If you think going back to skincare, if you look at Kodali, which we, who we've worked with now for six years, they are from Bordeaux. And the main ingredient is grapes. Now that I've told you that, if you look at the logo, you'll see a grape leaf over the eye. It's those kinds of details that at level that consumers either consciously or unconsciously understand, but feel. If there's one thing you've ever heard me ask over and over, it's this. Do designers really need to learn copywriting? We will always say that our designers have to copyright copy and the copywriters have to design and, and, and vice versa. So it, it, it starts building the story. All the strategists look at how the work is going is going, and, and the copywriters start writing things and, and the designers are using that copyright to design so that the brand embodies the strategy straight away. And I think that helps us achieve surprising and different um, results. We've talked about high-end retail, luxury baked goods, and prestige beauty, but can that same thoughtful, strategic approach work for any brand? At Base Design, they don't impose a signature style. Instead, they act like a mirror and they reflect the essence of a brand, no matter what industry it's in. But how do you apply that approach to something as familiar and beloved as cheese? New Yorkers know that Murray's is this beloved institution of, of cheese. Um, what most don't know is that it was acquired by Kroger. And if you go to many grocery stores in other parts of the United States, the cheese department is also Murray's. So it is, it is a beloved brand across the U.S. And it is a brand for everybody, meaning who doesn't like good cheese? And so really in approaching that brand, we wanted to make it accessible and reflect its New York heritage and reflect that spirit that you feel when you go on into the store on Bleecker Street with the, the chatty cheesemongers that are expert at what they do and reflecting their joie de vivre 
and their knowledge in the, in the packaging. So it's really about when we talk about stories, packaging tells stories. We start, that's why we always start with the big questions of how do we want to be perceived? How do we want to make people feel? And build a world around that that is appropriate to the brand. And in the case of Murray's, that's one that is really fun, very New York, and for everyone. And really diving into the process of when you're buying cheese, things that we take for granted, but when you're buying cheese and how is it wrapped and what even materiality do you need to address so that the cheese doesn't stick or that it doesn't ooze as you're taking it home uh, so that it looks fantastic as you present it as a gift. You know, these are the kinds of things that we take for granted as consumers, but have to think deeply about as designers. Brands don't just exist, they evolve. Taking a holistic approach and building the worlds in which these brands live isn't new. We experience them every day. But if there's one thing to consider from this episode with Anthony and Jeff, it's this. Years ago, I developed a phrase that I now repeat over and over to a lot of those that we collaborate with, which is recognition through repetition. And it's this idea that as a brand, if you repeat those key elements in the various channels that people start to retain that idea of what you want to project to the world. And so if we lean into, as Anthony was saying, a bespoke typeface or a color palette, and we make sure to repeat that across packaging, digital events, advertising, we have a much greater chance of people retaining the idea of how we want Bongini to be perceived uh, and therefore create an emotional engagement between the, the brand and its customers.